You know, for this particular story, I feel it's necessary we start at the beginning. All the way back. At the very beginning. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. Three years ago, I peaked. I made a career-defining video about the Haunted Mansion and Pirates of the Caribbean, and how they shared a common story thread. No, these aren't just a bunch of still photographs in the background. I'm actually playing the video right now for you guys in the background as I speak. It's pretty rough, if I do say so myself. I had just started out on YouTube, and I was kind of still learning the ropes. Today's a big day, though. I hit 250,000 subscribers. I didn't want to rehash the Gene Lafitte video and just do it again, but in a different way. Way. I wanted to make a video expanding on it, building on the story, and I wanted to make something for the fans, the real fans. And here we are, a quarter of a million subscribers later, and it's all thanks to my hard work. Okay, I can't keep that joke going. It's all thanks to you guys, and I wanted to make a video specifically for you guys about the topic that we're all passionate about here, the pirate lord himself. What's his name again? Gene Lafitte! Lafitte's Landing! Gene Lafitte, Gene Lafitte. Lafitte, Gene Lafitte! Gene Lafitte! Lafitte, Gene Lafitte! Gene Lafitte! Gene Lafitte, Gene Lafitte. Gene Lafitte, Gene Lafitte. Jean Lafitte, Jean 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 Lafitte. Jean Lafitte. Okay, okay! I got it! <sighs> okay, let's talk about Gene. When New Orleans Square opened at Disneyland in 1966, it contained precisely zero attractions. Unless you count the Disneyland Railroad, which a lot of people, including myself, do, so it opened with one attraction. At the time, it was dining and shopping focused, and a way for guests to immerse themselves into the spirit of New Orleans. But even just visiting New Orleans Square when it first opened in 66, you knew that it was going to be something different. As you neared the end of the land, you would see a massive antebellum manor stretch out in front of you with a sign in front that said, Don't be left out in the sunshine. Enjoy active retirement in this country club atmosphere, the fashionable address for famous ghosts, ghosts trying to make a name for themselves, and ghosts afraid to live by themselves. Happens to the best of us. This sign told guests what they would soon be able to find inside of the Antebellum Manor, a brand new dark ride helmed by Imagineers Mark Davis and Claude Coates called the Haunted Mansion. Further into town, though, if ghosts weren't quite your speed, did you wanted something more swashbuckly, Disney had something for you too. Eight months after the land would open, underneath the facade of the Cabildo building in New Orleans, you would find Pirates of the Caribbean. Another brand new dark ride that would, like the Haunted Mansion, make use of the state of the art at the time and, pretty mind-blowing even today, audio animatronic figures. And when the Haunted Mansion opened in 1969, it was an immediate hit. Same with Pirates of the Caribbean. But 10 years earlier, back in the 1950s, Disney had a very important piece of history in Frontierland. Or so it seemed. Underneath an old barnacle-encrusted anchor, there was a plaque which told you about a relic from a pirate ship commanded by John Lafitte in the Battle of New Orleans on January 8th, 1815. But the plaque also warned to not believe everything you read. When New Orleans Square opened in 66 and a pirate attraction was planned for the area, of course you would move the pirate anchor to the pirate area. It just made sense. And in what I assume was Disney building off of the lore of this strange anchor in New Orleans Square, a sign above the loading area in Pirates of the Caribbean was hung that read Lafitte's Landing. But before we explore Disney history, I wanted to go back and explore United States history. This is the best part of the video. Jean, uh, Jean Lafitte was a pirate who operated in the early 18th century in, of course, the Caribbean. Or Caribbean. Can never really decide between those two. You see, our old friend John and his brother Pierre had a smuggling operation going in the Bay of Barataria. Here at Barataria, which is a extremely fun word to say, may I add, John and his brother Pierre would smuggle in goods and sell them off, these goods having come from their pirate exploits out in the Caribbean. Operating in Barataria was a way for John and his brother to get out of the watchful eye of the United States government and sell their goods without being bothered. Of course, where they were was technically in the legal jurisdiction of the U.S. In 1814, our guy, Gene Lafitte, 
Lafitte. Jean Lafitte. Lafitte. Jean Lafitte. Jean Lafitte. Could tell something was up. He warned all the other pirates in the bay that the United States was planning on attacking their base of operations. They didn't listen to him. And later on in the year, a United States naval force successfully invaded Barataria and captured most of his fleet. And Jean Lafitte. Now a former pirate lord, in return for a legal pardon, helped General Andrew Jackson defend New Orleans during the Battle of New Orleans in the War of 1812, even though this battle happened in 1815. After the war, he founded a brand new settlement on the island of Galveston and eventually returned to his old piratey ways. His death, though, is shrouded in mystery and legend. Remember that though, because now we are going back to Disney history. Skipping ahead from the opening of New Orleans Square and its two legendary attractions in the 60s, we go ahead to 1994. At this point, Disneyland was seeing a sort of resurgence. After being considered what the kids would call lame for a decade or so, Disney had recently reinvigorated the parks, adding new attractions like Big Thunder Mountain Railroad and the exciting new simulator ride, Star Tours. It's at this point we meet the villain of our story. No, not an infamous pirate pirate lord or a ghost come back from the dead, this villain's name was Paul Pressler. A man whose past included being a producer on the Care Bears movie and working at a number of different toy companies all over the United States. And he became Disneyland's brand new head executive in 1994. Pressler was infamous for different cost-cutting measures he took all over the soon-to-be resort. And with him in charge, although guest satisfaction was down, profit was up. And that is all that mattered. And now back to your regularly scheduled New Orleans Square. Because of Pressler, there was tremendous pressure within the company to achieve 20% growth every single year and to cut expenses. Disney wanted to make money here, people. They didn't have time for quality. That wasn't what Walt envisioned when he built Disneyland in 55. No, it wasn't to immerse people into story and bring families together. He didn't care. It was all about the money. He didn't care that he had to take out a second mortgage on his house to pay for it. All he cared is that it was profitable. Wait a second, that's not accurate at all. One of the attractions or areas that was hemorrhaging the most money out of operations was Tom Sawyer Island, and there was a lot of pressure to redo Tom Sawyer Island to make it cheaper for Disney. And Imagineer Eddie Soto had the perfect idea. The rafts in particular were costing Disney a lot of money, not to mention the island wasn't really up to code or modern sensibilities. And instead of replacing an attraction with something else like Tarzan's Treehouse replaced Swiss Family Robinson, they wanted to reimagine Tom Sawyer Island. Eddie felt like the park needed a balance in the history-driven IP area versus something being character-driven. Character-driven intellectual properties are the things people think of when they think think intellectual properties at the Disney parks, like Frozen Ever After replacing Maelstrom, or the entire Cars Land land. Historical intellectual properties are something a little bit different, more like your great moments with Mr. Lincoln, or remember this, Andrew Jackson in Fort Wilderness on Tom Sawyer Island. So instead of re-theming Tom Sawyer Island around, I don't know, the Pirates of the Caribbean film franchise, they wanted to theme it around a real historical figure and pirate who was already mentioned in the land multiple times, Jean Lafitte. John Lafitte. His name is John Lafitte. So here was the plan. Disney wanted to save money on the rafts going back and forth to Tom Sawyer Island. So in turn, Eddie Soto and his team of Imagineers decided to create an all-encompassing story for all of New Orleans Square that would cover not just Pirates of the Caribbean, not just Tom Sawyer Island, and not just the Haunted Mansion, but all three attractions, and tie them in to one singular story. The story of the legendary pirate lord, now dead and buried, very close by, John Lafitte. In order to solve the problem of the rafts going back and forth between Tom Sawyer Island and the dock in New Orleans Square, the Imagineers wanted to build a tunnel. That's right, a tunnel underneath the rivers of America leading from New Orleans Square to the island. This would serve as sort of a pre-show to the island, which is sort of unheard of these days. And the tunnel wouldn't just be a concrete tube that you walked through, it would be themed to catacombs. That's right, like the ones in Paris. These weren't Parisian catacombs though, no. these or pirate catacombs. And I hear you asking me, t gosh, Dallin, where do we enter this tunnel to Tom Sawyer Island? I'm dying to know, and I'm glad you're asking me. You would enter through the crypt of none other than Jean Lafitte himself in a cemetery located 
near the haunted mansion. That's right, this mausoleum wasn't really a grave, but instead an entrance to a vast underground tunnel system leading to his secret hideout. I don't know why, I'm getting like, I'm getting giddy just talking about this. My hands are shaking. Disney, please! Please do something like this. This is a fantastic idea. Soto says that down in the catacombs you would be able to make rubbings from plaques and there'd be different sound effects and spooky effects that would go off in different places. This catacomb tunnel of course being a transition between the more scary atmosphere of the haunted mansion and the more piratey atmosphere of the new Tom Sawyer Island. When you arrived on the island, Fort Wilderness would be replaced by a capsized pirate ship full of treasure and different antiquities from the pirate era. As you can probably remember though, this was the Paul Pressler era and the idea was turned down. But in some ways, the story of Tom Sawyer Island becoming Barataria Island, John Lafitte's secret hideout across from the Haunted Mansion, lived on. Of course, we know now that Pirate's Lair is now taken over Tom Sawyer Island, and that may have been inspired by this idea. You have the old abandoned pirate ships that have run aground, and even a dead man's grotto tunnel. Although this one isn't really catacombs, it's more of just an old pirate cave. Back on the island, people used to be able to find Andrew Jackson having a nice sit-down conversation with Davy Crockett. When that set was removed later on in the 90s though, lots of the props from that office were moved to the attic of the Haunted Mansion, something that strengthened the shared theming between the two attractions. John Lafitte was even included as part of the backstory for the house in the Haunted Mansion movie starring Eddie Murphy. Not sure how canon that is to the Disney theme parks though, but either way, the story is there. People knew about this at this point. You can even find one of the chairs that was used in the Haunted Mansion movie in the Pirates of the Caribbean ride at both coasts. Is this just a coincidence? Them recycling props? Yes. That's uh, most likely the case here. But that just goes to show you how deeply intertwined these three attractions in this one land in this one theme park truly are. But there's one thing here that's sort of a smoking gun. Uh, it's not this, though. This is just really interesting. After Curse of the Black Pearl came out, there was an old Pirates of the Caribbean stage show outside Cafe Orleans. The stage contained a number of different props, like this smuggled pirate's gold, but there was one special prop that sort of stood out. Here we have a portrait of what seems to be your average, everyday pirate wench. But this is, in reality, the changing portrait titled April through December, which you can still find today on Walt Disney World's Haunted Mansion. There were a number of different changing portraits created for the original Haunted Mansion that were never used, but instead recycled later on into Walt Disney World's version. Is this Disney using a changing portrait from the Haunted Mansion in a little-known Pirates of the Caribbean stage show to draw attention to the fact that these two rides are connected story-wise, or are they just reusing another prop because it looks vaguely piratey? Probably the second one. But let's get back to that smoking gun I was talking about. There's one remnant of this Jean Lafitte overarching master story in New Orleans Square that is still there to this day that you can find and even take a picture in front of. This right here may look like a simple archway, but What's with the bricks? Why is it all bricked up? Where did it lead? And why is 1764 such an important number here? This bricked up archway also curiously sits right across the road from the Haunted Mansion. Eddie Soto himself made a blog post about this on his own website, where we read, Next time you're at Disneyland and stroll along the rivers of America near the Haunted Mansion, note this bricked up entry. Could this be the sealed entrance to John Lafitte's lost catacomb? Guests have been wondering this for more than a decade, and ironically, some of his legend has made it to the island, but someday we may explore the rest of his legacy. Till then, our caves are sealed. So yes, this archway is the bricked up entrance to John Lafitte's hidden tomb near the Haunted Mansion. Confirmed. But why 1764? Well, in my original video I said, Above the archway are numbers that spell out the year 1764. Now you're probably asking yourself, what's so important about the year 1764? Well that, my listeners, is when the Sugar Act was passed in Great Britain. What is the Sugar Act? I don't know. Oh, but you must be asking, oh, where did they get the number 1764 from? Was it from the British Sugar Act of 1764? No. No, it wasn't. I still don't know what the Sugar Act is. Stop asking. Now, this is the biggest hole in the theory, the biggest plot hole, so, I mean, it's a bit of a stretch, but it originates from removing 200 years from the birthday of the Imagineer who worked on New Orleans Square, Matt McKim, born in 1964, which, you know, I don't... 
I don't know why they do that. It's kind of confusing to me, but well, you know what, moving along. I'm proud to announce that after years and years of researching and digging and trying to find the real reason why 1764 is engraved above this archway, I finally found the definitive answer from none other than Disney themselves. In their D23 article about nine details in New Orleans Square, Disney says that 1764 is a reference to the year where the Spanish took control of New Orleans and when the first Cajuns made their way down to Louisiana and that this number is nothing more than paying homage to the heritage of New Orleans. And that about wraps it up. You know, some people may say that I'm forgetting a few things, but I'm really not, because it's in my video that I uploaded about three years ago. If you're interested in any more information about John Lafitte at Disneyland or Walt Disney World, I'll have these videos linked in the description down below. It's very interesting. I highly recommend checking them out. Gene Lafitte may not be at Disneyland or Disney World these days in the form of a underground tunnel underneath the rivers of America leading us to Tom Sawyer Island, but he lives on in spirit and various plaques and anchors throughout the land and I think that's what's important. He may not be there physically for us but if we look around and we examine the details within New Orleans Square then we can see that he is with us in spirit. No pun intended. You know, I, no, actually you know what? Pun intended. I intended that. And who knows, maybe with enough fan outcry and people passionate about these things, maybe one day Disney will represent John Lafitte in New Orleans Square through more than just a bricked up old archway with the number 1764 engraved above it. Now that is what I call a 250,000 subscriber special, am I right guys? Yeah, I thought it was pretty good. Thank you so much for watching this video. This one was made for you guys. The ones who stick around to the end and listen to me yam around about things that may or may not pertain to the actual video itself. You guys who stick around to the end, you're my favorite, but don't, don't tell the ones who don't stick around to the end because I still want them to feel loved too. Now I had a sort of thumbnail contest spur of the moment thing for this video because I couldn't think of a good one. So here are some runner ups, fantastic thumbnails made by Objection2007 on Twitter and this one I think which looks really cool because it looks sort of ghostly. It looks like the ghost of John Lafitte is haunting both the Pirates of the Caribbean and the Haunted Mansion ride. Uh, this one was done by MinkyMomo33 on Twitter. Please go check out these people. They did a really good job on these thumbnails. And the image I ended up using in this video was done by my man Corv over on Twitter. Go follow him. He does a lot of Disney related tweeting if you're interested in that. I think this one won me over because it features a cool blending of the two concept arts for the two rides with the man himself standing right in the middle connecting it all. Now I'm sure if you're watching this far into the video you already follow me on Twitter and you're most likely subscribed but if you're not I'm just gonna give you a quick reminder to do those things. It really helps. If you're interested in further helping out the channel visit the link to my Patreon in the description down below. My patrons actually got an early kind of sneak peek to this episode a few days ago, so if perks like that interest you, head on over there. Even one dollar will get you access. To finish all this off though, I just want to say thank you all so much for your support over the years of whether you've been around since the beginning from the very first Jean Lafitte video, or if you're newly subscribed with this Jean Lafitte video, thank you all so much for helping me reach 250,000 subscribers. It's such a big milestone and you know, I honestly don't know what to say. It's 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 amazing. Here's to 250,000 more subscribers in the future. And as I say at the end of all of my videos, but that I really truly do mean from the bottom of my heart, thank you for watching this video, you guys, and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.